今天给大家介绍二零一七年在全球最受关注的一本书《未来简史》。这本书的作者尤瓦尔·赫拉利是一位来自以色列的历史学家。他在二零一二年出版的《人类简史》，凭借对人类过去七万年发展历程的重新诠释，席卷全球。但是在《未来简史》这本新书中，赫拉利进行了一个更大的挑战。他试图推演未来的人类社会将会是什么样的。首先邀请大家做一个思想实验，想象人类的科技和认知水平随着时间发展发生了急剧的爆发。那么生活在这个时代的人会有一种什么样的体验？这个问题不用问别人，因为现在的你就站在这里。一百年前的人们无法想象即将发生的科技巨变将如此深刻地改变人的生活方式。而赫拉利将要描绘的未来，对于现在的你我而言，恐怕也是无法想象的。你是否认同以下观点？每个人都有唯一的一个真实的自我，这个自我有自由的意志。在现在这个自由主义盛行的时代，这个观点被认为是颠扑不破的真理。但是最新的神经科学、脑科学研究认为，以上的说法都是错的。《未来简史》中提到的实验表明。我们可以通过核磁共振读取人的大脑，提前几百毫秒，甚至提前几秒，知道人类的自由意志选择。甚至还有更夸张的，人类已经可以通过给老鼠大脑中插入电极，来让他们做出自由意志的选择，比如直走、转圈，甚至从高处一跃而下等等。运用同样的原理，美军已经开始在人脑中植入芯片，通过释放微弱的电流，让大脑特定区域麻痹，万无一失地治疗了创伤后应激障碍。这些令人震惊的实验，让赫拉利与科学家们做出了相同的判断：人的大脑就是一台机器，就是一系列神经元之间的电化学反应而已。不仅不存在所谓的自由意志，人的意志也可以被干涉甚至控制。赫拉利进一步大胆推论，未来的人类会主动地把决策权交给计算机，大数据和人工智能将在不远的将来逐渐替代人类做出决策。AlphaGo 横扫人类棋手，只是人工智能时代来临的一个小小前奏。在医疗领域的一项实验中，计算机算法能够正确诊断百分之九十的肺癌病例，远远高于人类医生的百分之五十。旧金山的计算机药剂师在一年中开出了两百万张处方，一个错都没犯，远远低于人类药剂师百分之一点七的犯错率。IBM 的超级计算机 Watson 也屡次在临床表现中完胜人类医生。同样，司机、翻译、股票交易员、律师等等人类现有的大多数职业，将无一例外地被人工智能取代。当这样一个时代到来的时候，将会出现这样一群人，他们所能做的一切，人工智能都能做，并且能做得更好。人类社会也将出现这样一个无用的阶层。最后，赫拉利还做出了一个大胆的判断：未来所有的计算机所连接的这个汇集了人类所有知识和数据的万物之网，将变得越发全知全能。这个建立在硅基上的大脑，终将发展到碳基人类无法理解的地步。它不仅是人类最值得信赖的工具，也会作为一种更高层级的神，为人类赋予新的意义。The really big revolution of the 21st century will not be in our tools, in our vehicles, in our society, in our economy. The really big revolution will be in ourselves, in humanity. The main products of the 21st century economy will be bodies and brains and minds. We are now learning how to hack not just computers, but how to hack organisms, and in particular, how to hack humans. We are learning how to engineer them and how to manufacture them. So it is very likely that within a century or two, Homo sapiens, as we've known it for thousands of years, will disappear. Uh, not because, like in some Hollywood science fiction movie, the robots will come and kill us, but rather because we will use technology to upgrade ourselves. Or Uh, we will see an extremely unequal society as elites and states lose their interest, lose their incentive.
to invest in the health and education and welfare of the masses. The 19th and 20th century were the age of the masses. Uh, the masses were the central force in politics and in society. And almost all advanced countries, regardless of political regime, invested heavily in the health and education and welfare of the masses. Even dictatorships like Nazi Germany or like the Soviet Union built massive systems of education and welfare and health for the masses, hospitals and schools and paying teachers and nurses and vaccinations and sewage systems and all that. Why did they do it? Not because Stalin and Hitler are very nice people, but because they knew that they needed the masses. Hitler and the Nazis knew perfectly well that if they wanted Germany to be a strong nation with a strong army and a strong economy, they needed millions of poor Germans to serve as soldiers in workers, the army, in the factories and, and offices, which is why they had a very good incentive to invest in their education and health. But But we may be leaving the age of the masses. Uh, we may be entering a new era in which the masses are just not useful for anything. Uh, they'll be transformed from the working class into the useless class. In the military, it has already happened. It's very often in history that armies march a few decades ahead of the civilian economy. And if you look at armies today, you see that the transition has already happened. In the 20th century, the best armies in the world relied on recruiting millions of common people to serve as common soldiers in the army. But today, the best armies in the world rely on fewer and fewer humans. And these humans are not your ordinary common soldiers. They tend to be highly professional soldiers all the elite special forces and super warriors, and the armies rely increasingly on sophisticated and autonomous technologies like drones and cyber warfare and things like that. So in the military field, most humans already in 2017 are useless. There is nothing to do with them. They are not needed to build a strong army. The same thing may happen in the civilian economy. We hear more and more talk about the danger of artificial intelligence and machine learning pushing millions, hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of people out of the job market. Uh, Self-driving cars that 10 years ago sounded like complete science fiction. Today, the only argument is whether it will take five years or 10 years or 15 years until we'll see more and more self-driving vehicles on the road. And they will push all the taxi drivers and, and truck drivers and bus drivers out of the job market. You won't need uh, these jobs. Same things may happen in other fields like in medicine. Uh, computers and artificial intelligence are becoming better and better and competing and even outperforming humans in diagnosing diseases and in recommending treatment, which is what most doctors do. Uh, there will always probably be work for some doctors, but maybe not for the vast majority of them. The uh, army, like in the you army, don't, you no longer need millions of GIs. You need small numbers of special forces. So maybe also in medicine, you won't need millions of GPs. You will just need some elite special forces that research the latest treatments to cancer, and the vast majority of the work of diagnosing people and recommending treatment is done by non-human doctors, by AI doctors. Of course, new jobs might appear. Uh, people say, OK, so all these, all these, you don't need truck drivers, and you don't need your ordinary family physician. But there'll be many new jobs, let's say in software engineering, who will, de who will program all these new AI programs. And there'll be lots of jobs designing virtual worlds and things like that. One problem, this is a possible scenario, 
one problem with this scenario is that as AI becomes better and better, we have really no guarantee that even programming uh, software is something that humans will, be do, will do better than computers. The problem is not in having new jobs in 2050. The problem in, is having new jobs that humans do better. Uh, just having new jobs that computers do better won't help in terms of, of the job market. Another problem is that uh, people will have to reinvent themselves again and again and again in order to stay relevant, in order to stay in the job market. And um, this may not be easy. If you think about an unemployed taxi driver or an unemployed cashier from Walmart who at age 50 loses his or her job to a new, uh, uh, to a new machine, new artificial intelligence. So at age 50, to reinvent yourself as a software engineer, this is going to be very, very Moving difficult. Moving from being an agricultural worker to a working in some um, car factory in Detroit, you moved from one low-skilled job to another low-skilled job. When you lost your job at the Detroit car factory and got a new job as a cashier at Walmart, again, you moved from a low-skilled job to a low-skilled job. But the next stage, if, what, if, if, if the next stage means I'm losing my job at 45 as a cashier at Walmart, and now there is an opening as a software engineer at Google designing virtual worlds, this is going to be much more difficult than moving from the car factory to, the, to Walmart. And it's very likely that even if there are new jobs, most of the unemployed masses will not be able to make the transition. It's also a big question about, about young people that nobody really knows what the job market would be like in 20 or 30 years. It's really the first time in history when nobody has any idea what kind of jobs and what kind of skills people will need in 30 years. Which means that we have absolutely no idea what to teach children at school. Most of what they learn is going to be irrelevant to the requirements of the job market and of society in 2050. What to teach them instead, we just don't know. And the worst problem, of course, is not in the developed countries, but in the developing countries. Finally, there is the question, the political question of authority. What we may see in the 21st century, alongside the processes I just discovered, is a fundamental shift in authority from humans to algorithms. Uh, there have been a few previous shifts in, in authority in history. Um, hundreds of years ago, in the European Middle Ages, authority came down from the clouds, from God. You wanted to know who should rule the country or what to do, whether in terms of national policy or in terms of your personal life. Authority to answer these questions came from God. Came humanism and said, no, the highest authority is the human feelings, whether it makes humans feel good or bad. If two men are in love and they don't harm anybody else, both of them feel very good about the relationship, they don't harm anybody, what could possibly be wrong with it? We don't care what's written in the Bible or what the Pope says. We care only about human feelings. So this was the ethical revolution of humanism. Um, placing human feelings at the top of the ethical pyramid. And this is also why humanist education, the main ambition of humanist education was very different from education, say, in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, um, the main aim of education was to teach people what God wants or what the Bible says or what the great wise people of the past have written. Uh, the main aim of a humanist education is to teach people to think for themselves. 
you go to a humanist educational establishment, whether it's kindergarten or university, and you ask the teacher, the professor, what do you try to teach the kids, the students? So the professor would say, oh, I try to teach history or, or, or economics or physics, but above all, I try to teach them to think for themselves. Because this is the highest authority. What do you think? What do you feel? One last comment before we open the floor for a few questions. It's very important to emphasize that uh, nothing is really deterministic about all that. What I've outlined in this talk are not forecasts. Nobody really knows what the future would be like. There are more possibilities that we need to take into account. And we can still do something about these possibilities. Uh, technology is never deterministic. It gives us options. If you, again, look back to the 20th century, so the technologies of the 20th century, the trains and electricity and radio and television and all that, you could use these technologies to create a communist dictatorship or a fascist regime or a liberal democracy. The trains did not tell you what to do with them. Electricity did not came with a political manual of what to do with it. You have here a very famous picture taken from outer space of East Asia at night. What you see at the bottom right corner is South Korea. What you see at the upper uh, left corner is China. And in the middle, it's not, a sea, it's not the sea, it's North Korea. This black hole there, it's North Korea. Why, now, why is North Korea dark while South Korea is so full of light? Not because the North Koreans have not encountered electricity before. They've heard of it. They, they have some use, use for it. But they chose to do with electricity very different things than what the South Koreans chose to do with it. So the same people, same geography, same climate, same history, same technology, but different choices lead to such a big difference. You can actually see from outer space. And it will be the same with the 21st century. Uh, bioengineering and artificial intelligence are definitely going to change our world, but we still have some options. And if you don't like some of the future possibilities that I've outlined in this talk, you can still do something about it. Thank you.